What's up, party people? Another episode of the Horns Down Podcast. Got a special guest with me tonight. About to go live. You guys know what's going on. DeMarco Murray is staying. Got to talk about the running back room. Got to talk about BV a little bit as well. And definitely got to talk about this new SEC schedule. So uh, with that being said, catch you after the intro. You know, there's a lot of great OU podcasts. There's only one. The horns are always down. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Horns Down Podcast. I'm joined today by my guy, Brady Trantham. See, got it. Tell you. There you go. From uh through the keyhole podcast. Ready? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and shut up and, and just tell everybody where they can find you at, like where they can hear you at, where they can find you at, all those different things. Tell them where they can uh, come and get your, your content. Yeah. Um, through the keyhole. I mean, you can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. So I guess what Apple, Spotify. Uh, I think that's basically where everybody listens to their podcast. At least that's I'm too I'm too lazy to find anything else. So that's where we put it. Um, and I'm sure it like filters in through other things. I don't, I'm not a scientist. So um, just type in through the keyhole. Hopefully, hopefully you can find it. And if you need help, if you need extra help, um, we've got a Twitter account as well. It's at keyhole pod on, well, I guess it's called X now. So Twitter <laughs> X, however you want to characterize it. Um, that's where you can find that. And if you want to, I guess, follow me on the same social media app, it is at Brady does sports. So, I think that's the rundown. I've got three other guests that I do through the keyhole with Peyton Guthrie, uh, Alan Kenny, and Matt Burton. And uh, we've been through the keels existed in some way, shape or form when it was inside OU back in 2018, 2019. I think, I think it was going into Jalen Hurts's first year when I started that podcast with John Hoover and Rufus Alexander. And then it morphed over time. I had Keegan Renault and I do it for a few years and then Peyton picked it up. Once I uh, left the podcast for about a year and a half and they, uh, I guess I got kind of bored and jumped back onto it uh, last season. And hopefully it was a good luck charm because when I was off the podcast, we went six and seven and then we went 10 and three. So hopefully, (laughs) hopefully things are uh, pointing in the right direction. All the superstitions, we need that. So (laughs) with that being said, before we get started, go ahead and like, subscribe, do all those things to the podcast, not only this podcast, but through the Keyhole podcast, come to Patreon, do all those different things. Brady has a lot of great things to say, very knowledgeable about OU football and all things that are related to OU. I think you also did some stuff about with the Thunder as well uh, back in the day. Am I right about that? Yeah, I covered the Thunder for, let's see, the first thing that I did it for was a website called Thunder Obsessed, and that yeah. became Thunder Digest. I did that for about two or three seasons, and then I got hired by 107.7 The Franchise and covered the Thunder for them for the next, basically until the um, the COVID year, the bubble year, and then the season after that, and it also kind of did like, you know, fill in stuff on shows and then therefore had to talk about OU football, so I tried to hide the fact that I was a, a fanboy. <laughs> for, for the Thunder, it was easy because, I mean... Russell Westbrook's fun to watch. He is um, interesting to cover, but yeah, to to him every night, you know, it, it kind of, it, it kind of, it's, right? like, it it's one of those things where, um, it, like, I, I didn't necessarily, obviously, didn't grow up a Thunder fan, but Russell, like, covering Russell Westbrook on a night-to-night basis was a very good lesson. And don't meet your heroes, but yeah. you know, if uh, if people talk to me every day when I screwed something up at work, I probably wouldn't be the best person to talk to. <laughs> Well, hey, there you go. See, I just wanted everybody to know my guy's valid over here if you haven't like seen him with your eyes, but you probably heard him. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it, man. Uh, DeMarco Murray. DeMarco Murray was uh, reportedly interviewing for the vacant running back coach uh, uh, spot at Ohio State. And so I mean, it's, it's kind of old news, it's dated news, but just what were your initial thoughts, kind of what are some things that you heard about it? Was it a serious conversation or was it just a leverage play on his part? Yeah, I believe um, the Ohio State, uh, that, that website, whatever it's called, I can't remember what the publication is called or the the social media account that reported it, I believe it got reported Monday morning 
or maybe sometime over the weekend. And the first thing that popped in my head was just the timing of it. It was really interesting to me. I mean, OU it obviously is going through spring break right now. The players aren't practicing. They practice all last week or at least four of the five days. And now they have the week off. So the coaches obviously aren't on the field coaching. So all the coaches are, you know, got some free time. So it would make sense that if you're able to uh, have an interview, now would be the time to do it if you're an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. But it also came, I believe, a week or so after the recent Board of Regents meeting came out that announced all the new coaching raises and therefore their salaries. And so my, you know, like, I guess my nightmare fuel thought um, with the timing and seeing that report was, oh, is he not happy about his place on the pecking order of the offensive staff? And mm -hmm. then, you know, when you think that, you, you kind of like, well, why would he, why would that be the case? And then you kind of go down the rabbit hole of, well, last season's running back production, the running back room, you know, was a mixed bag, to say the least. It ended on a very high note. Um, but I think OU fans and even DeMarco Murray himself, if you put a truth theorem in them, uh, expected uh, that to be – far more consistent than what we saw um, last season, even with having the third best offense overall um, in the country. Um, perhaps it's just kind of DeMarco's place on the staff is a, is a little bit, I don't want to say out of place because he's DeMarco Murray. Um, he's a, a legacy here at OU. Um, he's a great player, great former player, and he's made a lot of waves in recruiting just his um, short tenure as an assistant coach. But um he came on to uh, Lincoln Riley staff. Lincoln Riley left. Uh, then he was uh, shoehorned into Jeff Levy's system. And now he's in Seth Luttrell's system. So all that to say that whatever DeMarco Murray's ideal uh, system or offense that he would want to be a part of, he's not necessarily had that much of a say because he's essentially a, a position coach. So that, that was my like go down the rabbit hole nightmare fuel thought when I saw it. At the end of the day, I thought... Eh, I don't see DeMarco leaving. I just, I can't see that. Not, not right now, not at this stage of his career. And I've often asked people that have been on through the keyhole that cover OU football on a day-to-day -day basis. Like if you ever get a chance to talk to DeMarco, please ask him what his career aspirations are, because I assume every position coach, every assistant coach at any level wants to eventually be a coordinator or a head coach. That would just be natural to me. Uh, but DeMarco is a very unique case because he retired from the NFL when he was I mean, not necessarily in his prime, but he still had you know a handful of years left where he could have been a high-end offensive player in the league. He jumps right into um, broadcasting. I believe he was, he was doing color commentary for Fox, and he's incredibly charismatic and incredibly talented and mm -hmm. obviously very photogenic on camera. So I thought, yeah, he's going to be great. And then a year later, he's already in the coaching ranks at Arizona and then, of course, um, ends up here at Oklahoma. So he's very unique. He doesn't necessarily need money. He doesn't need anything like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, is he in a perfect spot for him? You know, like he's raised his family here. He, um, he spent a lot of his younger, younger days here. He played for the Dallas Cowboys. So he's kind of made this region of the country his unofficial official home after being from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it would be a very good question to ask because I just don't know. He's never said like, yeah, someday I want to be a head coach or someday I want to do this. Um, so you see that report and you just can't help but think like, I mean, I don't think he'll leave, uh, yeah. but it would, I, I guess it would make sense in terms of just like trying to build your career. It would make sense to, yeah. you know, maybe go elsewhere, maybe like up your resume in that, in that fashion. But fortunately, I mean, as you've mentioned, it's already happened. And uh, DeMarco is at least here for the next three years under contract for, uh, I mean, I've heard reports of like $800 million. So I believe that makes it <laughs> the top five or the top three, um, for uh, running back coaches in in the country, so oh, you took care of their own, and I mean it's pretty good, pretty good to uh, know that you kept them from a blue blood like Ohio State. Yeah, I mean it, it was it's definitely uh, an interesting piece. I know that um, it may come to uh, come as a shock to some, but hey, there are several coaches on the staff. BV told you that. Um, BV told you that uh, earlier when he did the pod with Eichern and Lehman about, hey, there, you know, there were teams that were coming out for beating Bow or teams are coming after Emmett Jones, especially um, teams that are coming off of um, off after uh, D DeMarco. I mean, the thing is, is that it's a perfect time to try to snatch DeMarco because you're telling him, hey, look, first off, come up here and, and coach this extremely talented 
uh, running back room. I feel like you have a really good running back room there. You have a talented running back room, but we feel like ours is elite, right? You got Judkins, you got uh, Henderson up there as well. But also the fact that this arguably was probably his worst worst coaching um, display I guess you can say. And I wouldn't even say that from a talent perspective or what he was initially trying to do, because at the end of the year, you know, towards the end of the year, Sawchuck got going, right? Yeah. And you got to, you know, settle in on one guy. You stop playing around with, um, um, gosh, well, who's the kid from Millwood? Marcus Major, yeah. Javante yeah. Barnes. You yeah. Know, you, throw, you throw in Dalen Smothers in there. like, And that's kind of the thing that I, I don't know that we're ever going to know is yeah. when Jeff Levy was the OC – I mean, who is making the decisions of ultimately putting guys on the field for individual plays or packages? Yeah, uh, because because their coaches like Brent Venables or the the few weeks that um, the media had access to Jeff Levy, um, they were always going to say, well, you know, if you're talking about running back rotations, like you know, you d- go ask the guy, Demarco. Like, I mean, he's the one making those decisions. They always defer to the position coach, knowing full well the yeah. media doesn't have access to Demarco Murray or other position coaches. I mean, that's what. That's what kind of bothers. I mean, that's what kind of bothers you because you, you. I sit here and I say, yeah, I think this is kind of his worst coaching display this past season. However, I want to say that there were just issues. I feel like there were just mostly issues within, but kind of behind the scenes that kind of lingered into the season and yeah. kind of. I mean, it just happened, but. At the same time, I think the thing is, is that you kind of have to wonder that one year that he had with Riley, Riley was doing things totally different. Um, There were players that beat and wanted to play that were not playing. There were different things that were happening. Same could be said about Levy this past year. Was it the fact that Levy trust his guys and he knew exactly who he wanted to play at certain times? Because, you know, Levy was really big on on his scheme, his formations and his pa- his packages, he was big on that and he knew what personnel he wanted out there on the field. So was that really a detriment to us? You get what I'm saying? So no, I mean you're right. I mean, again, that's gonna be the thing that we, we'll just never know is where where exactly did the buck stop with the offense? Uh, because it's one thing if there are injuries, because that's another thing is they're never going to announce it's not the NFL where you have to like say this player is injured with this injury and here's their timetable. Like there is a process that injured players have to go through. So that's very transparent. Right. College coaches don't have to play that game. So there might be rumors or reports or like what, what access the media has to like warm ups um, for practice. You might see a guy like in gym shorts and shoulder pads when everybody else is in pads. So you kind of like make estimated guesses if you also don't see them on Saturday Uh, But I mean, even with that, I mean, I I remember a time during the season and I mean, I hate to bring up the Kansas game, (laughs) but you know, you, you you know, up until that game, like it had been a handful of weeks. I think, I think Javante Barnes hadn't played since non-conference. I think SMU or Tulsa might've been the last time that we had actually seen Javante Barnes um, for any, any play, whether it be, I mean, if he's on special teams, I don't know, but I just remember that being kind of the, the growing narrative. Once you get into the um, week of Kansas, there were like podcasts out there, people covering the team, just suggesting that Javante Barnes might medically redshirt. He he might have had a like something happen with his rehabilitation from the offseason surgery he had. So that was in the atmosphere at the time. Then you go into the Kansas game and all that BS happens. But OU does find themselves in position to just close the game out and sneak out of Lawrence with a win. They have the ball. All you need to do is essentially get a first down or two, bleed the clock, and you know, game over, and you end out with a win that you're we're all frustrated with. And on the most important drive of the season at that point, to stay undefeated, to stay in the playoff hunt, knowing that you know Tommy Walker got hurt, so Gavin Sawchuck comes in and he scored a touchdown um, on the goal line. Yeah. In the most important drive, Javante Barnes is out there. And I, I just don't understand that personnel decision. And is yeah. that is that made by DeMarco? If so, okay, now, now that you got your money and now that you got your big contract, it, you're getting away from like 
we love you, DeMarco Murray, former, you know, awesome OU football player. Now mm-hmm. you're going to start getting judged for decisions like that because that that didn't necessarily lose OU the game. Yeah. But I would have rather had saw Chuck <laughs> in in that situation to maybe yeah. do something else because uh, between him and Barnes, saw Chuck has been the only guy to really showcase an ability to make plays um, that are, you know, when they're not there. Barnes yeah. is just going to run straight into the hole. Yeah. And open. Cool. If well, not, not, only, not, well, a not lot. only that, well, not only that, but he was a, a saw Chuck was a healthier option as well. Yeah. I think the thing about, I think the thing about, about Bournes is it's, it's like his freshman year, he saw the holes, but he was just a little bit hesitant this year. It was like, he, his vision was, his vision was probably the worst thing about him on the field. Honestly, it was good. he just didn't see the hole. You're sitting there like, hey, there's two lanes. You take this lane right here. You were headed that way, and then you cut back inside. Like, what are you doing, you know? So, um, I mean, it's one of those things where you're just hoping that he's full health and he can get back to himself because we came into the season talking a lot about that Florida State game because they're – I'm not a big, you know, consolation prize type of guy, but there were a bunch of hidden gems in that game where you're looking and saying, hey, look, the, the first hidden gem that I found was the run game because Sawchuck and Barnes have shown me against a really good defense, that Florida State defense, um, that they can run that peel. They can run that rock and they can they can get yards. They can be flashy. They can be finesse, but they can be physical and run in between the tackles as well. So you're sitting there saying, why didn't we have that dynamic this year? And I mean, but it kind of goes back to, to, you know, like our point, like, it was it Lincoln, was it Levy, or was it DeMarco? Because you also have to wonder about that year that we had Kennedy Brooks and and uh, Eric Gray, but Eric Gray didn't really do anything until his last year with us. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. I mean, we've seen really good running back play under under uh, DeMarco Murray as far as what he's trying to get those running backs to accomplish. But there have been a couple of dud years where you're just kind of scratching your head, like what's going on, you yeah. know? And it may it may kind of go hand in hand, 50-50 with look, this is what you're teaching because this is what you uh, are are being told by um the OCs that hey, we're running these schemes, we're running these plays, have your guys ready, you know. So I don't mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe he's just working with what he can, but at the end of the day. I think that I think that um Seth Luttrell is maybe the maybe, you know, hey, look, third time maybe the charm, right? And he he may be the one that actually figures it out because if you go and watch a uh, film on uh North Texas when he was there and you watch a lot of the offense, especially with the run game, it's it has a, a bunch of similarities to what Levy was trying to do. But to me, it just makes a lot more sense because guys, it 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 just feels like I don't know. It just feels like they're going to be lanes there, and all you have to do is just run through. Because I mean, they he he that offensive line and the way that that run game is built in the, in the trail system, very physical, very physical. And I understand you can say the same about Levy, but Levy was all about, hey, I'm about to. I want to get to the second level and, and give my running back a chance to basically beat that linebacker or that safety that's coming down or whoever's going to be there at that second level. But with the trail, the trail is north south. Hey, we're going to run over you. It doesn't matter who's there, you know? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm really excited about that. So I'm hoping that that will be kind of the glue piece that we've needed all along. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting just because, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about with DeMarco and his 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 performance as the running back coach and then the running backs, I mean, a lot of it's just going to kind of hinge upon the offensive line's ability to uh, kick ass from day one or have a cohesive unit of guys that can play well together. Because as we all know, like Bean Bow's going to tinker with the starting five, you know, well into the season. And it more times than not works. The problem is you don't necessarily want to be going into week seven or week eight in the sec knowing that I have maybe two or three guys that I am still trying to decide whether or not they should be starting moving forward. I I, I don't know if you have that luxury in the big 12, you can get away with that because you're not playing, 
high-end edge rushers. You're not playing high-end defensive lines, even mm-hmm. like linebacking cores. You're, you're playing a lot of good coaching staffs that can make it difficult on you. Yeah. But when you have the talent that OU has, when you have the athletes on the offensive line that OU has, you, you're kind of afforded some you know, some luxury time of trying to figure all that out. Mm -hmm. If they're able to figure things out, then it's just really going to come down to like, in terms of the running backs, it's just really going to come down to Gavin Sawchuk. Can you be healthy from spring into summer into fall camp? And then onto, into day one game one, um, uh, as running back one at OU because the other, and the other tough part is, you, right. you know, one of the recruits that we're excited for, Taylor Tatum, he's a summer enrollee. I, I wish he'd be an early enrollee because of the physical demand that, that position has. But it's just going to come down to that. It, can the offensive line open up holes and can guys be healthy? So speaking of that, and that kind of goes into our, our, our next topic, Sooners Legends podcast. Y'all check him out tomorrow at 6 p.m. Probably be on there with him and Jason. But he says, Brady, do you see Sawchuck as uh, RB1 this upcoming season? So that leads us really into our next topic, talking about this running back room as a whole. So these last couple of shows, I mean, episodes that I've done, uh, Brady, outside of the one with Chris Mason, um, when I did a show with Barry and then uh, D-Mac as well, we've kind of been doing, I guess you could call it like player profiles almost. We've done one about Jackson Arnold, why he he will be successful, top five reasons why. And then we just did one recently about Jaron Kenny, right? So now I think we should just really talk about Sawchuck and the entire running back room as a whole. Like who is the guy that's going to separate themselves this year? All eyes are on two guys, two names, and you just named them, Sawchuck and Taylor Tatum. Now, Taylor Tatum is coming in uh, late. I don't necessarily see him cracking, uh, uh, getting on the field early, early. Maybe later in the season we see some things from him, but I really feel like you're going to see um, Sawchuck, and then I I think you're going to see Caleb Hicks, and it's up to Barnes if he's going to. I hope so. Yeah. (laughs) Go ahead. Yeah, I'll let you go ahead. No, uh, yeah. I was going to say, I hope we get to see Caleb Hicks because if anyone's ever had a chance to see him in full pads, kind of, you know, not, I've not been on the field, but, you know, been relatively close uh, when I went to the Cincinnati game last year and I kind of went down and went a little close to the field. He's huge. (laughs) So he, he looks like an SEC back. So I hope we at least get a little bit of, I guess, production out of him, at least in the non conference, to see what we have moving forward. But in terms of running back one, I think you have to go Sawchuck. The biggest question with Sawchuck is just, can he be healthy? And I mean, you mentioned earlier that um, the running game got going towards the end of the season, and it certainly did. But the last thing that we saw of Gavin Sawchuk was he had a hammy pull him up on a long run in the Alamo Bowl. And I'm sure if it was a more important game, I'm sure he probably could have played through it. Who knows what his status would have been if that had been in the middle of the season? What kind of ha- like pulled hamstring would that have been? Who knows? But Given what we know about um, Sawchuck's brief stint at OU, he's been either hurt or playing and playing very well. So, again, it just kind of comes down to can he be healthy? And at this point, I hate to say this, he's just kind of a, an injury risk. And mm-hmm. so I don't know if they, they feel like they need to, like, maybe put the uh, blue jersey on him for fall camp at least. But, I mean, I would love to see him day one, game one, <laughs> um, as running back one. Um, in terms of, like, maybe like a dark horse – uh, I mean, we already mentioned Caleb Hicks, and I guess he'd be the definition of since we've not seen any of him. I mean, people are excited about Xavier Robinson. Um, he certainly has the size to take the punishment um, in the SEC, and he uh, apparently he's been getting a lot of glowing reviews um, early in spring ball and in winter conditioning. Uh, I will say I'm kind of excited about Sam Franklin. Uh, the uh, I believe he's from UT Martin. Yeah. Uh, what, what are those Tennessee schools? Yeah, that's uh, the school he's from. Yeah, um, I, I guess the the casual easy thing would be would be to say that he's essentially the Tawi Walker replacement. But mm-hmm. I'm sad Tawi Walker's gone. I love me some Tawi Walker. I love when a running back just falls forward and turns a two yard gain into a four yard gain because that stuff adds up after a while. And if you can take the punishment, which Tawi Walker certainly could for the most part, that's a valuable asset to have. Um, I'm glad OU went out and got a proven uh, back 
with a similar style to Tawi Walker to essentially replace that position. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be shocked if uh, we find ourselves in a, in, in a spot where you have, you know, Sawchuck ideally healthy as your starting running back, as your workhorse, but you throw in a Sam Franklin, that would be great. Xavier Robinson, that would be great. And I'll say this for Taylor Tatum. I have my doubts too, just like you do. But it seems like everybody I talk to that has a better feel for him and his ability, just they kind of look at me like, you don't know what you're talking about. This kid is the number one running back in the country for a reason. Yeah. So probably the best thing for him is if he's completely versatile, like in the way that he's being, being billed coming out of high school, if he's able to run some routes, if he's got soft hands, then I'm pretty sure Seth Luttrell will find a spot for him. Maybe like you said, what, later on in the season. What about Emeka? I guess because another. I guess another dark horse. I, I mean, it seems to be kind of like that. That bruiser. Yeah, he's definitely smaller than Tawi and uh, and X. But you look at him and the kind of the way he wants to run between the tackles, and I'm not mad at it as well. I think that um, if if healthy, I mean, the guy, kid's a former four star. People were high on him whenever we got him. They thought that was a pleasant surprise that we got him as what a PWO, I believe. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, he could, he could find himself on the field, uh, field as well. That's what's so crazy about this running back room is how I hate, I, for the lack of a better term, how bipolar the decision-making is as far as who is playing and who's not. Um, I always feel like you kind of have to circle that wagon. We'll have to wait until after the spring game to kind of see if there's going to be any transfers out of that room anyways. But, I mean, I, for me, I, if I gave you a top three, I would say right now my top three would be Sawchuck, Barnes, and probably Franklin simply because I don't think you go and get that guy just to, just to basically put him on the bench. But I think Hicks is right there as as the replacement for any of those guys that go down. But yeah. when we talked about when we talked about Sawchuck early on, you know, I was big on saying, look, there's certain guys on this team. Everybody was doing their videos about who uh what guy needs to have a good winter and spring and this and that. I said, look, he needs to have a great winter a great spring, a great summer, a great uh, a great fall camp. Canick is another guy. Uh, it'd be nice to get Justin Harrington out there for, for another chance at that. be nice to get McCullough out there for that. be great to have Trace Ford. Sawchuck and some of those guys I just named, it's you can't you don't have enough time to you don't have time this summer or this entire uh, off season to take mental reps, you got to be out there for the actual reps. Like you need that because going into the SEC, as I think that the SEC is not as great as everybody's trying to make it out to be um, very top heavy as it's always been. But my biggest thing is, is just the, the group, the gruesome, I mean, not gruesome, but the grueling um, uh, season that you play the grueling, the gru grueling schedule, excuse me, is what I'm trying to say. It's a long schedule and it's going to be some teams on there. Uh, Tennessee is going to be a really good matchup. You know, they're going to run tempo. You got to be ready for that. Then when you go to, um, Auburn, Auburn's going to run the best of both worlds, but all those teams are going to try to be more physical than you. And so, that is, I mean, and, and I mean that can be said for anything. It can be said in the Big Twelve, but in the SEC, that's what they say, big boy ball, right? So you got to be ready for all of that stuff. I just feel like you know, mental reps can't be a thing this year with those guys. Can't can't read the tea leaves and, and hear that he's on the sideline with a hamstring injury, this and that. Injuries happen. I know you can't control them, but at the end of the day, it, it's to me. I think it's dire that uh, a guy like Sawchuck has a full off season, especially in the Smitty program. Oh yeah. I mean, at this point, I mean, at this point in his career, I mean, you got, it's like put up or shut up time, especially as a running back. Like you want to, if you're as good as you think you are. And I think we all think the world of Gavin Sawchuck mm -hmm. um, he's, I think he's certainly a running back that should have some NFL aspirations. I mean, if you're as good as that, then you should be thinking about, I need to get out of college as quickly as possible just because of how the position is valued. Unfortunately, 
in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And so like, this is a huge year for Sawchuck because you don't just need to go out there and show the production because I'm sure scouts don't really give a damn about, you know, how many yards you've rushed for, how many touchdowns you score. They want to see just your ability to bounce back. They want to see your ability uh, against the best. And I mean, I, I tend to agree with you about the SEC in that like every team is not going to be a national title contender like it's being billed as. But the big difference is you're playing when you play Auburn, when you play on the road at Auburn, I mean, that's a tougher environment than Ames, Iowa. That's a tougher environment even than all due respect to Manhattan, Kansas. We've had some difficulty there in the last decade but yeah. it's a different it's a different animal in jordan hair uh, but it's also just auburn is not they were not very good last year no. but that, but that is a team filled with players that yeah. if they hit the portal and oh you had the chance oh you fans would love to have like half of those players um yeah. via the portal so that, i mean that's the big difference if kansas state players hit the portal i don't think oh you fans are really like I mean, maybe one of them, but, you know, you kind of just move on. I mean, that that's the big difference. And for Sawchuck, got to protect your body. And, I mean, for all of us, you know, you just have to have a good, a little good luck as well. Exactly. Exactly. And I agree. And, I mean, that's – yeah, <laughs> I definitely agree. I, I just – man, I just want Sawchuck to, to go out there, be able to showcase the speed, be able to showcase the, showcase the physicality. But I also would love to see Borns out there – uh, get it on as well. He came into the season in great shape, man. He he really worked hard, um, you know, to get to that point of just really having that that elite look. But it was just the fact that injuries and all the rest of that stuff, and he just really could could the vision. I don't know what was wrong, but I'm hoping this year clears up a lot of things. Um, Stogner and that offense that we had last year, even though the offense was was great at times was just basically serviceable wasn't really a you know a true difference maker but the but the thing for me was was just that the blocking wasn't there and i think this year with the tight ends that you have with roberts um mitchell once he gets acclimated to this speed and this level of uh this level of the game um you got um gosh uh bauer sharp um those type of guys, right? You have those guys. You got the kid from um, from Michigan State that was a PWO as well. So I mean, you got guys out there that can block it. We and I think we both know, as we did our research on you know Seth Latrell recently, he loves to use those tight ends, and not only as uh, pass catchers but as blockers as well. Like I said, guys, I cannot wait for everybody to see that split zone buff. It's going to be the coolest <laughs> thing. You see that? Everybody picks up their blo uh, their blocks, 40-yard uh, run off to the races for uh, for Jackson Norton right down the sideline. It's going to be beautiful. So, no, I mean, I I'm, I'm excited about the, about the running back room. I'm excited about the prospects, man. It's just the fact that we have to be consistent this year. And, you know, I, I've been on record for saying that, hey – I think this is the one year that I would look at BMO and say, hey, I can't afford to, to be into uh, the Tennessee or Auburn game trying to figure out my offensive line. I need to know my guys day one. If we have to figure something out, we have to figure something out. But I need to know my guys day one um, on that offensive line because um, arguably this is – this to me is the most ex uh, not experienced, but the most. I don't even know if you can say talented, but it's up there. This is probably the most talented he's been on the offensive line in quite some time. And I mean, from from a depth perspective, there he is not too many bad choices on that depth chart. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the problem is just going to be like so, like playing tackle, unless you are truly special. And unfortunately, OU seem to have a a. a player that was very special in terms of the talent just walk out the door and fortunately that's just the way the game is played nowadays um but unless you're truly special um as a football player that's a hard position to learn it's a hard position to learn especially when you are uh, going up against five-star edge rushers essentially every other week yeah. so that's going to be a challenge and it just it's just why this time in spring is so important it's, it's awesome that that beanbo has a diverse array of talent to choose from and it's essentially you've got nine eight nine months now to figure it out um because like we talked about earlier you don't get the luxury of 
you know, playing average Iowa state or average West Virginia, um, after you play Texas to kind of extend your window of trying to figure out your, your starting five, the, the guys who play the best, um, with the offense together as a unit, you don't get that luxury anymore. So you got to figure it out fairly, um, early. I mean, just like with Sawchuck, you just, you gotta also be fortunate with, uh, avoiding injuries because mm -hmm. no doubt, He's probably got an idea right now who his five are because he understands what's at, what's at stake here and he understands what the challenge is. And if you have an idea this early, you're probably going to force feed them a lot in terms of spring reps, um, letting them know what to do during the summer. And then once you hit fall, it's like, no, you guys are it. If you guys are not it, then we're going to have a problem. And the more and more and more that you practice that way, the higher, I guess, the risk is for you know injury or just fatigue by the time you get to um, uh, the football season. But yeah. that's just that's just the the risk well, we you take. We don't want to be like Herman and put him through a death camp for uh, just a one no, season, no. Right? You, you don't. <laughs> I can't. I still can't believe that. I still cannot believe that that happened. You just death camp your kids for. Houston and OU. You get the win, and then you're like, I'm done. I'm just waiting for the Texas gig now. <laughs> Wow, man. All right. Um, let's go ahead and switch gears here. So want to share this to the screen real quick. So we have on here, let me put that up a little bit. So there's been a lot of hoopla about this whole schedule, about, you know, there's a gauntlet, this, that, that, and this. And basically all they did was just say, hey, whoever you play on the road this year, you play them at home next year. Okay. So I, th I saw that you had some thoughts of, uh, on this on Twitter, so I'll just let you go ahead and go. What are your initial thoughts about this 2025 uh, uh, schedule? Yeah, it's. I, I guess I thought too hard about this because I have been under the assumption since um, the SEC announced before they before they announced the 2024 schedule, when they basically said we're going to do the eight game plus one. Um, system for 24 and 25 and i thought okay so whatever schedule we get for 2024 we're just going to flip the home games to away games and the away games to home games for 2025 it makes the most sense because um quite frankly i want to have a chance to go to tuscaloosa pretty quickly and uh -huh. obviously that would mean in 2025 since they're coming to norman i guess the alternative would have been that you just truly grab teams out of a hat and say, okay, now you're going to play these teams because we're waiting essentially for the nine game system, whenever that's going to come to put some permanent, you know, whether you want to call it pod schedule or um, permanent rivals, you know, whatever you want to get that out there. Um, I, I was kind of not looking forward to having a tough schedule in 2024. And then you miss Alabama for 2025, the road contest, and because there's 16 teams in the SEC, we might not have a chance as a fan base to go to Tuscaloosa for three or four years. So I'm I'm happy that they just did the simple thing. But again, I was completely shocked that people were like surprised about this or that this needed to be announced. I just assumed that this was what we were going to do. And I thought, oh, I, I must have just, I must have lucked my way into the correct thinking. It's not like I'm a genius. I just, it made the most sense to me to just flip the schedule over. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it made sense to me. I, I I didn't see really any problem with it. Honestly, um, I think it, it maybe gets tough. Well, I don't know, because Ole Miss probably loses a lot. Probably the better teams on the schedule the, 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 uh, in the 25 season, because I know people are on Twitter chir uh, chip chirping about this right now, about who has a tougher schedule between OU and Texas. But some of these teams get better – by subtraction, honestly, um, Auburn probably loses Peyton Thorne, which is, you know, not the, you know, worst thing ever. Um, and then uh, Tennessee, Tennessee should be better simply because Nico would be in his second year. And you're thinking that he's going to live up to the hype, right? Um, then South Carolina, I think South Carolina is pretty excited about their uh, new quarterback as well. And I think the only thing that would make me kind of hesitate to say that they should be good in 25 is the fact that I'm not sure if Beamer gets out of this year, honestly, possibly. I mean, I've seen crazier things happen. Um, Ole Miss may take a step back simply because they probably lose everybody. I'm sure that 
I mean, I don't ever know if Jackson darts, if his stock is ever going to be better than what it is today, you know, cause I, yeah. I mean, it, it just, I think he, him and Dylan Gabriel kind of just one of those guys that, you know, like, Hey, for all the good that they can do on the field, it just kind of is what it is, you know? Um, and in Texas, Texas will probably will most likely be ushering in a new quarterback, even though that system is very friendly to quarterbacks and they're big on arch. I think that will be kind of the you know thing to monitor is the pressure, the excitement, the hype, and then also just the fact that he hasn't played legitimate football in the last what two years, two or three years. So was it wasn't the class he played in like is he from was he from Tennessee or Louisiana? Louisiana. Wasn't the class he played in like really low? That's what a lot of people try. Uh, that's what a lot of people ran at him. You know, I've seen Odell Beckham and guys like that played at his school. So I don't, I don't know. At the end of the day, I mean, it's Louisiana, you know? That's true. I, I, I mean, that's true. <laughs> that's, but to that point, I would say Odell's a freak. Uh, Arch Manning is just a name to yeah. me. You know, I, I'm just, I'm just still mad that he is considered a better recruit than Adrian Peterson. That to me is just, it makes me want like put him in at starting quarterback so I can watch OU kick his ass. Like I, I like that is that is an affront to like football religion. He's not better than Adrian Peterson. Nah, you know, hey, some Texas, <laughs> hey, some Texas fan. Hold on, Center Cowboys. He got here. He said he played in two A. Some 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 uh some Texas fan gonna get in these comments, boy. They about to go on you. <laughs> they about to get on you, man. They about to get on you. Live rent free, huh? <laughs> but no. nah, I uh, I just think that's. I, I mean, I I don't I don't know. You know, for me this year, like I've told everybody, I think that if we don't look at the season, you got to change the way you look at. it. You got to change the optics, right? Don't look at this season as a whole. Don't look at the schedule and say, man, we got to play them. We got to play. No, take it three games at a time. That's all that you're trying to do. To me, just take it three games at a time. Yeah, you know that you have. Temple, whoever the hell else, whoever the hell else. Um, and then, you know, you got Tennessee coming, right? So, I mean, the thing is, is that you got to go handle business against uh, at home. Got to go to, I think you got to go to, um, guys, speaking of Louisiana, what's that, uh, the main green Tulane? I think you got to go to Tulane this year. So you need to go and handle business out there, right? Come home, handle business again. And then guess what? Fourth game of the season, you're playing Tennessee. So you need to go ahead and set the tone. So, I mean, you need to get through those three games. Then you got Tennessee. Then you got the trap game, the ultimate trap game, which is Auburn. Then you got Texas. Then after that, that's the back half of your season. And so, I mean, I, I just I, – I think that if you look at it in that that thing, you're just saying, hey, look, we, we can get past these seven and six-and-a-half game spreads that they're giving us, right? But – um I, I just feel like I mean I like I like the schedule and Michigan being there I think that's pretty awesome you're gonna have Michigan coming to uh to to the Palace that's that's gonna be cool man we may have to go to that game bro we we, we may have to go to that one <laughs> yeah yeah I mean and you got um, hopefully I mean I, I I feel bad for him uh but Sharon Moore is he's a former Sooner so I mean I guess go Michigan but. Hopefully he's still there in 2025. It's just Harbaugh did not leave his his boy a lot of a lot of. Help. Oh no, man! <laughs> but uh, he left him a Lamborghini without the uh, without the steering wheel, the, uh, the rims, everything. Right? Yeah, it's he like it looks great from the outside. It looks great from the outside. Then you get in, and you're like, "Hey, this car won't turn on." Uh, but you know that would be pretty cool to have like a a blue blood in Michigan come to town next season, coached by a former Sooner. So that should be a pretty cool game. But like the biggest thing, other than just the home schedule being so much more fun um, than any home schedule that we could probably remember, mm -hmm. is the fact that you got three true road games. I mean, and and two of them very difficult. I mean, Tennessee is a place that we've uh, won. Uh, OU has won in the last handful of years. OU fans are. Um, well versed with that town in Knoxville because that was a big special game. Um, Alabama a little bit further in the past and well before Nick Saban, of course, but it's still a city that OU has been to and had success in. Uh, but those are going to be two environments that are very tough. And fortunately, South Carolina is the third one. And who knows what South Carolina is going to be like? I mean, they're about as that's about as Big Twelve a matchup as you can find in the in in our schedule, where it's kind of comparable to okay, you're playing. Iowa State, you're playing 
West Virginia, you know, you're playing a school that has some talent and there could be some matchup funkiness if you're not careful. But at the end of the day, you take care of business. You're OU. You should win that game going away. Um, so having three true road games in potentially year four under Brent Venables uh, with more depth um, being developed, with more recruiting going the direction that we that we enjoy seeing it go into, even with that tough of a slate. I mean, you got to you hopefully, you know, 2024 gives us some more optimism moving forward, even if that's an eight or a nine win season, even a seven win season, just depending on how it goes. Um, but 2025, despite it looking like quite the gauntlet, I mean, it does set up pretty, pretty well for you considering three true road games. That's the year that a lot of people have picked as, hey, oh, you is that's that's the season. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. I mean, if Jackson's that guy, I mean, 2025, I mean, if Jackson's that guy, 2024 could be the year um, for all we know. If Because if Jackson Arnold is truly the quarterback that we think he is, that he's been billed to be as a top, uh, as a five-star, super can't miss recruit quarterback, then he's already in the top three in the SEC this season, you know, at the quarterback position. And that should put OU in the driver's seat for a lot of these games because, I mean, in terms of the 2024 schedule, I mean, you've got to think like Ole Miss, Auburn, Missouri, like th those three schools have hype, but they also have a lot of flaws and we just do not know yet until the games are played. So we've got eight months to just kind of go down a rabbit hole of Ole Miss is going to be great or Ole Miss is going to be kind of mid. Here's why. Mm -hmm. And whichever part of the spectrum that those three schools fall on, that's going to heavily influence what OU's results are going to be in 2024. If Missouri was completely kind of a fraud and just a product of their soft schedule last season, then mm -hmm. OU should be able to go to Columbia and take care of business like we have done for the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. If Auburn is still kind of climbing out of the hole that Harson put them in um, a few years ago, then Although it's a road game in a tough environment, oh, you should be able to go down there and take care of business. And then you get those two wins on top of the four probably guaranteed non-conference wins. And who knows with Texas, who knows with Tennessee, you know, you got to like your chances the rest of the way. Yeah. I, I you know, for me, I, look, I, I say this season and the reason why I keep talking about like just breaking it up into, you know, three games at a time is because look, perfect example, right? Um, Tennessee, tempo, big tempo. Got to be, got to be lined up right. Got to be able to get the calls as early as possible on D to be able to get with that. You've practiced against it for the last two and a half years. You're going to see a lot of it uh, um, to start the season. Teams are not going to be sitting there trying to run straight up with you. They're going to run tempo to try to get you uh, off balance to, to keep you on the field, make you tire, and also be able to score, move the ball on you, right? But that's what Tennessee is going to do. It's going to be a lot of funky spacing, a lot of different things. That's the brows, that veer and shoot, right? So you have to be ready for that. But then you go to Auburn. If you, uh, you watch that Auburn versus Alabama game, right? This past season. Oh, yeah. What did Peyton Thorne do a lot of? Peyton Thorne did a lot of QB runs, and he was running and he was being physical early and often and, and then later in the game when he needed to, right? So the thing is, I see them I see them trying to implement uh, some QB run, trying to, you know, basically do a lot of little quick short game, and then try to lull you to sleep, maybe throw it a, a, a deep a couple of times. Peyton Thorne isn't the best quarterback. I've been on record saying that, but I think this is a game where it's not necessarily Thorne, it's the scheme. And I, I, I mean, hey, I'm just going to be honest with you. I like the old, I like the old head ball coach up there. Uh, Freeze is a is an offensive. Uh, he's an offensive. He's he's definitely an offensive mind. One of the top ones, and so I think that's a game right there where where I consider it to be a trap game. But I do think Auburn is going to be better than they were last year. I think they had a lot of momentum. Um, they had a lot of like I said, I'm not a big consolation prize guy, but they had a bunch of consolation type um momentum that they gained from last season because it's clear free said it hey look we we're we don't have the roster right now but you do that then you go to texas and you know what sark is going to give you sark is going to give you um it's going to be be hit or miss either you're going to pick up and take away all those little cheap plays if 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 i i just want six teams next year to stop that stupid ass 
uh, little running back screen that they run, the little play action running back yeah. screen. I'm like, Jesus. When we stopped that this year at the uh, at the Red River game, I was like, I, I we we went in this, we went in this. We know what they run. <laughs> we know what they run. We we already got a pick off of that off that dumbass slant, but I know <laughs> I know what they're running. I know exactly what they're running right now. Everybody knowing here, I was clowning, but I digress. But that's what I'm saying. Like you know, just take it three games at a time. I see ten wins this year personally. <clears throat> I know that may be a little bit optimistic, but I am a big optimist. But opti- I mean, optimistic person. But I, I see it. Yeah, I, I think you could you could narrative yourself into some like like trying to figure out like how 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 would OU win some of these games? So I mean, Tennessee, Tennessee is going to be a challenge. Josh Heupel, we know that that game's going to mean a lot to him. I think it's pretty well documented, at least to people that are close to the program, that yeah. Heupel still likes OU. He has nothing but good things to say about OU and the players that he played with um, during his time at OU, has fond memories of OU. But the breakup with OU and, I guess, his old boss, Bob Stoops, did not go very well. So I have no doubt that this game is going to mean a lot to him in the uh, stadium that you know he he brought back um, back in, 2000, in 1999 and 2000. So, uh, however... That's OU's first game in the SEC, so it's going to be a juice crowd. It's going to be a gigantic environment for Norman, for Sooner Nation, for everything. So you can narrative your way into, well, OU Sooner Magic will be alive for their first game in the SEC. So let's pencil that in for a win. Mm-hmm. Auburn, you're exactly right. I think they're going to be better. The question is, I mean, where are they going to be? Like in the pecking <laughs> order of the SEC still? Because, yeah. I mean, Freeze did not inherit a lot, like you mentioned. Um, but he is still he's a coach that I'm afraid of, even with Brent Venables as your essentially your defensive coordinator. And even going back to his days as the DC at OU, one thing that really kind of I guess bit Brent Venables in the ass was a running quarterback. Mm-hmm. And I have no doubt that Freeze will will know that. It seemed to not bite him at Clemson because he won a national championship, what uh, once against a running quarterback in mm-hmm. uh Jalen Hurts. Um Tua is not necessarily a runner, but um, Will in the water. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so at the same time, again, like where exactly is Auburn going to be in the pecking order of the SEC, even even if they're improved? And where is OU going to be? If you want to err on the side of OU being in the top half of the of the conference, then they should be able to go down to Auburn and win. So you're what six and zero, oh, or one, two, three, four, five? I can't count five and zero oh, heading into the Cotton Bowl, and that's going to be tough. But I think the biggest advantage OU has in that game is Texas plays Georgia the next week. <laughs> and so any game time decisions, you know, I would assume that Sark would, I would assume that players at Texas would want to play that game because that game means a lot to OU players, to Texas players, to high school players from the state of Texas, from Oklahoma, and so on. But when you've got Georgia on the schedule instead of Iowa State or Baylor, there might be some like, eh, you know what? Sit this one out. We'll like you'll be 100 percent next week. And if that if that helps OU, then so be it. Hey, um, look, look, my Texas guys go get on here. They gonna say they ain't running from the smoke. They gonna say they want it all. They gonna say they they this they that. I'm like, I don't think y'all got the juice that y'all had last year. Y'all lost <laughs> but y'all do what y'all want to do. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Now, I mean, having said that. I don't necessarily know that I'd pick OU to beat Texas. Now, to be fair, I didn't pick OU to beat Texas last year. So I was oh, you're wild. You're wild. Was, you're hey, wild. Who are what, you? What two or three, two or three plays into the game, you know, you get the pick with Gentry Williams. And then as soon as that happened, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, we're winning this game. <laughs> so I was like, I don't care. I don't care. We're winning it. Like my my brain just completely flipped into all right, win. And thankfully the good guys did win. After that, you get South Carolina. Like I said, that should be a win. If Ole Miss is as good as they are hyped to be, that is going to be a very, very, very tough game. No. If they are probably around where the laws of physics demand they should be, because I think if you look at teams in college football, even in college basketball, that are copy-pasted or Frankenstein from the portal, where it's just nothing but portal guys, those teams seem to not do very well. Yeah. Now, Lane Kiffin might be the coach to make that work. He might be the Dr. Frankenstein necessary for that to work. But I think from what we've seen um, with the portal's history, I mean, I think it's I think it's a big enough, I don't know, 
to think that, oh, you could go down to Oxford and get a win. But let's just say, you know, after the Ole Miss game, you're six and one, six or five and two, or six and two, seven and one. At that point, you know, you got Maine, that's another win. You're probably going to end up with, I mean, a disaster would be just when ending up with eight wins and losing the rest of them. But if you, at that point, you're probably going to have nine, maybe even 10 wins like you predict. If that happens, then, oh boy, the hype train is going to be off the charts because that that's a playoff team in the expanded playoff. And then you've got 2025 to look forward to, like we've already kind of talked about. I'm listening to you. Keep, I thought, <laughs> you're speaking that gospel yeah. right now. You speak that gospel. It's just, it's really easy to look at the schedule in 24 and either just go down and, you know, just a nosedive nightmare of like, oh my God, six wins. And look, if somebody gets hurt, if there are injuries, like we will all adjust our expectations. I think we all did like in 2009 where you lose Sam Bradford five minutes into the into the season. You lose Jermaine Gresham before the season even begins. Yeah, You lose a bunch of guys on the offensive line as the season goes well, along. So no, it's no, like, no, no, no. Let's, 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 let's not even go that far back. Let's go to this, this season here. You thought that you would make that pivot, but it was like, once Andre Anthony went down, it was all for for about three oh yeah in the seat, three games last year. You're sitting there looking at Levy like, dude, like I know you didn't forget how to call plays, and then, yeah, but because it, it pisses you off that you go out there and have performances like you did against UCF, Kansas, O State, and then come back against. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I actually think West Virginia has a pretty stingy defense, and you made them look pedestrian out there. Oh, then, yeah. then you go against TCU. TCU was not the same TCU this year, but you put 69 points on them to close out the seat. Like, like, and, and then BYU, don't even get don't even get me. You know what? Let's move on. Let's move on. Because I'm about to go out of <laughs> So last last topic. We got a few more minutes. I want to uh don't want to take up too much of Brady's time, but th- this this conversation, let's go ahead and remove this thing here. And let's go ahead. It's the last question, folks. Gonna put this on the screen. There we go right there. Why does BV get so much hate? And, and, and I just don't know. He's a he's a likable person, passionate about the game, a proven winner, a championship uh, caliber coach who's won championships. Don't ever hear uh, players have anything bad to say, even the ones he shipped out. Don't even have anything bad to say about Brent Venables. Caden Green essentially said that he was a liar, but I don't think <laughs> think I think the worst thing we can say about Caden is that he or that we can for certainly say is that he's an unreliable narrator. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think there was a there's yeah. Don't even get me started on that. But <laughs> I mean, you know, is it because he's a first time head coach? Is it because he coaches at Oklahoma? Is it because he came there and this whole screwed up? relationship situationship all this stuff that happened with riley caleb williams basically oh you being the biggest tabloid story out there like what is it because mario cristobal has done stuff to cost his team his, his team games <laughs> i can't believe uh, that story. don't even get me started <laughs> on uh on billy napier down there in florida you I know said- that's a so dead got, man walking, bless his heart. <laughs> I got it. So I got a friend. I, I can't wait. I, hopefully you you come on to the show and stuff like that from uh, again. But I can't wait for you to meet some of the some of the guys, but especially Ty. Ty said it best. Mario Cristobal and Billy Napier should be sending care packages to um to uh BV every week. And I said, why you say that, Ty? He said, because. BV losing that first season uh, 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 cast this huge shadow over what they were doing down there in Miami and Florida because he said they did worse than what he did, and he caught all the flack. And the fact of the matter is is that he inherited the sins of the father, as he likes to say, from Lincoln Riley. He he tried to tell everybody this roster is not what it is, but I'm going to pump some sunshine. But he said Miami and Florida, no. No, they didn't do anything. But BV gets all the flack for everything, and it's just like it's not necessarily a national narrative, but it's it almost feels like some people just don't respect him what he's doing here at OU. Yeah, 
I, I, as it pertains to like Brent Venables v like Mario Cristobal, nobody cares about the University of Miami unless they're really, really, really awesome. Yeah. Uh, when, when they are what they are, like people hype them every once in a while when they remember that Miami has a football team. They're like, yeah, I remember like when I was a kid, Miami was awesome, depending on how old you are. Uh, and then they move on. And they just look at the recruiting rankings and assume, yeah, they should be good. And then the season comes along and it's over and Miami has seven, eight, nine wins. And you're just like, eh, move on. So being the head coach at OU is always going to get a lot of eyeballs on you. It's a blue blood for a reason. And it's a, um, it's a football program that has bred a lot of, I mean, just a lot of hate over the decades um, we've had we've had very talented players. We've had very talented teams. We've had very talented teams that kick your ass and remind you about it while it's going on. And fans don't necessarily like that. They don't like to see the boss like tackle tackle your best player and then essentially flip them off on the field. So um, it, it's going to pain, you know, give you a lot of vitriol against anybody who's leading the program at OU. Yeah. Now for Brent, you know, I would say that anybody who's passionate about something is going to either like have a lot of, they're going to have a lot of people that love them. They're going to have a lot of people that don't like them just because when you're emotional about something, when you're passionate about something, uh, it just put, it puts you more out there to be dissected or criticized by people who just don't match your energy. And I mean that I'm sure Brent doesn't care. He, he's 50 some odd years old. He's been on the earth a lot longer than me. So he surely knows that. Uh, but if you want to look at it with a fine tooth comb, there just isn't a lot of, there isn't a lot of precedent for a long, 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 long time coordinator getting their first head coaching job in their late forties, early fifties and having a lot of success. Yeah. And so I think people are just really, really trying to get ahead of the, you know, the story and just wish casting themselves into Brent Venables at OU just didn't work. And Again, that comes a lot of that comes from if OU is not good, that probably benefits your team that you root for, the program you root for. Because if OU is good, they're gobbling up a lot of the players that you want. They're winning a lot of the games that you would want to win. So it just comes with that. It's not a story if OU wins. Like if you're talking about um, the national media, it's a story if OU loses because we've had four or five bad seasons since 1947. And I don't think one program can say something cool like that. Even Alabama, I mean, they, they've been great for two decades. Uh, the 90s were tough. But the 90s were tough. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's just Bear Bryant and Nick Saban. Yeah. You know? Now we've got a handful of names that we could pull out of a hat and say in any college football historian would be like, yeah, they're a great one. So we're very fortunate. But with Brent, it's just people just don't want it to work. And I will say, like, I, I love him to death, but he does say some things that are kind of like a eh, little, little, little cringy, little, little clown school, but he's a passionate guy. So it's going to elicit reactions like that, even from people that root for him. So hey, if your coaches are saying some cringy, corny, old dad joke type stuff, your coach ain't really about it. Your coach is a little bit too new school for me. I'm old. Yeah. School, so I'm, I, no, I, 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 man, I, I love everything. I, I, I trust BV. Uh, me too. Me too. BV, BV and company have came in and taught me something. I think they taught a lot of people something. Trust your own evaluations. Do your own homework. Get the guys that you really want. At first, when you know he left, it felt like you know everybody was saying, "Oh, well, he's running these video game type uh, defenses, or he's running these high complex defenses that just don't make any uh, that much sense." And then people were so happy when. My uh, uh, Mike Stoops came back. As great as Mike Stoops was, it just kind of felt like after that that second experience, right? Kind of felt like the game had passed him just a little bit. And so, yeah. Venables, that is, I was gonna, I was, I was gonna say that is one thing that we can kind of take away for Brent Venables is, you know, every every coach is different. Just because yeah. one coach might be older doesn't mean whatever applies to that guy doesn't always have to apply to a guy of the same age. So. You know, Mike Stoops comes back and the going thought, you know, a few like maybe even year one of his uh, second stint. And then, of yeah. course, well into his uh, second stint um, as the D.C. to OU, it was very apparent that the game had passed him by and the players were just not responding to his coaching, you know, for, yeah. for one reason or the other. You know, he's an older guy. 
the players today seem to be responding to Brent Venables and his message. So just because he's older doesn't necessarily mean that young kid, young, you know, college athletes are not responding to him. They're not responding to an old guy. Um, no, they, they very much do. And so that that's a good thing is that the players have taken to the message. They've taken to like building the program up with him. No. And I even think some of the things that we might take for granted or think that are kind of corny, like the soul mission, you know, just yeah. as fans, because we don't get to experience that. But in the age of NIL and the age of the transfer portal, mm -hmm. I appreciate Brent Minimals trying to go slightly in that direction, but also trying to cultivate this idea of, mm -hmm. hey, in order to be great, you can you have to do all these different things. And if you are great, here are some avenues for you to sustain that success. And he's setting up his players mm -hmm. um, with uh, resources to do that. Well, and it's it, it's stuff like that. Like I wasn't the greatest. You know, I hurt my knee, did different things like that. But, man, when you're a college athlete, and especially when um, – I'll just throw this little hypothetical out there, right, this little, little this little narrative. You know, you come back, best shape of your life, red shirt the year before, hurt your knee, basically on the end of the bench, fighting, scrapping, practice, everything is going well, still don't see the results to be able to get out there on the, on the floor, Right. That stuff is demoralizing. That stuff is it, it, it's crazy. So things like the soul mission, him being passionate, him being able to get those gym, like it, it's invaluable, man. Like you don't know it until you're there as a player. Then on the other side, you know, obviously you did you you're still in the journalism building. I mean, journalism business basically. Uh, kind of being like an amateur back when I was in college and all the rest of that stuff, you know. Um, I love his press conferences. Why? Because they're not the generic bullcrap that you get from everybody else. Like guys like Nick Saban, guys like him, uh, guys that are willing to talk and actually kind of give you a little bit of what's going on where you don't have to go and read the tea leaves or watch everybody's podcast or this or that to find out what's going on. You can actually hear from the source as far as like, hey, he's being direct with us as far as what's going on. Maybe he's long winded, but I'm a long winded guy myself, you know. <laughs> But I, I, I just feel like sometimes BV receives hate from a lot of circles that you're just like, damn. You get on Twitter, you get on them Twitter spaces, you're just like, damn, where did that straight come from? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> yeah, it's just wish casting, man. Like it people yeah. want to owe you to suck. I get it. We we've not sucked for a long, long, long time. So uh -huh. It's great. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, and, and, the, and the biggest thing is, is that I, I, I still, you know, and it's people from outside and they'll never understand this OU business is big business. Right. But people from the outside won't understand. They understand that, hey, Lincoln came here and won um, what three or so um, Big 12 championships. And that's great. But he had close to. All time talent on his teams and couldn't get over the hunt when it mattered the most, you know? Yeah. And I think that's something to be said, but I also think that getting here that first year really exposed a lot of things. And, you know, my uncle says it all the time, Hey, if, if BV had to do it all over again, I bet you he would have went harder in the portal that first year. Why? Because he knows the kind of the, the tone that that set for everybody nationally uh, on OU and I felt like that left a bad taste in his mouth but it's actually good because it made him hungry and making BV hungry is a hey, that's that's crazy but no I, I just I just think it's an interesting topic sometimes I just I just hear strays being being shot at him I see stones being th through to his uh through every window in his house and I'm sitting there saying hey man Billy Napier People are on Twitter right now. <laughs> like, Billy Napier, you see the schedule for the next two years? <laughs> he may not make it out. <laughs> he may get fired. They may tell him, you're going to have to take a Greyhound home, son. I'm talking about he coming over here to Texas, Austin, and they tell him, hey, you can't take the team jet home. He having to get a Greyhound to go home. But And then Mario Cristobal. Mario Cristobal can kneel to, uh, kneel to win the game, and then he doesn't do that. Then they go out there and lose to Georgia Tech. What sucks for them is Nick Saban's not coaching anymore, so you can't just go through like the Nick Saban car wash of rehabilitating your career if you get fired, you know? Yeah. So it's like, where are these guys going to go? Like for Napier, he needs to get ready to talk on camera because 
November, <laughs> December, like he, like you need to be looking to be on like ESPN guest spot on game day, my man. That's get, has nothing to do with him. I'm sure he's a fine coach. It was just bad time to be Florida's head coach with the window he's got. Yeah, man. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man. Um, Brady, I think last time we talked, you said that you guys were going to um, be making that transition to uh, YouTube as well. So go ahead and tell us a little bit more about the show and uh, and about the podcast where they can, uh, yeah. where they can find you again and tell them about that transition that you're trying to make. Yeah. Uh, through the keyhole, you know, like I said, it's all, all over podcasts. So Apple or Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, just type in through the keyhole. Um, it's, if you don't know, it's a Joe Washington reference. So there you go. Um, I do it with Peyton Guthrie, Matt Burton from the franchise and Alan Kenny. Um, you've probably seen him on Twitter or written or read some of his articles. He's a fantastic writer. Um, so check that out. Um, we've got a Patreon page as well. It's patreon.com slash through the just, um, it helps us out because with that transition that you talked about, Chris, um, uh, we're trying to get a website going. So, our articles that I write that Alan writes on the Patreon page, they're all free. I don't want ever, anything to essentially be behind a paywall. Um, if you want to help donate to the cause, I mean, we will appreciate that very much and it will allow us to do more cool things because we want to do YouTube shows like this. We want to engage with an audience in real time and make you guys a part of the the fun because this is, I mean, we're fans and we, we like this and we're not, we're not, we don't paint ourselves as insiders. We don't paint ourselves as better than you, or we don't speak for the fan base. We want to be a part of the fan base. We just have microphones and a camera. So, um, hopefully around the spring game, hopefully a little bit after the spring game, maybe, um, we've fully transitioned to having a website where you can find everything and then a YouTube show. And then I think, uh, we've got a Twitch stream and I think we're trying to figure out a way to maybe like when NCAA 25 comes out, that'll be mm-hmm. kind of like the, through the keyhole, like launch. And so you'll, you'll get to watch me like run QB sprint draw or whatever. Uh, like I used to on NCAA, like what? Oh, two or Oh three with, with a pre torn ACL, Jason white and Quentin Griffin and just running, <laughs> running, <laughs> run into the, um, the far side of the field and just outrunning everybody. So um, hopefully um, we're able to do all those fun things, but we can't do it without the uh, support of our, I think we've got about 90 or so patrons. And so um, we appreciate yeah, that. Like, hundred last time I saw it. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, um, I can't count. Like I said, like earlier, like I'm trying to count all these little helmets on the schedule. I'm like five and oh, four, one. I don't know. Yeah. No. I'm a writer. I'm not a, not a mathematician, but yeah, through the keel, um, we put out shows on Tuesday for free. And, um, we put out Patreon episodes like two, like one or two a week during the off season. But of course, once we get into football season, the content comes churning out much quicker, much more frequent, frequently. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hey, and all the links, all the rest of that stuff, the ads for, uh, to follow us on X and all, and all the rest of that stuff down there, uh, you guys to see it. So go ahead, like subscribe, do all those different things, get on the Patreon, become a Patreon member, do all those things as, you become uh you're in this transition period or whatever don't be a stranger to the show man come back home hey, of course i am um, i mean we work out at the same gym chris we've been working out at the same gym for <laughs> almost two years yeah and, uh, it's like it's one of the first times that you and i actually started talking and uh, we're like oh we both podcast but OU football that's let's be friends and uh yeah like in the last few days i've watched a few of your shows you guys do a fantastic job this is now like up this is kind of in my uh my listener queue so, um, I mean, I love OU football content of any kind. So I appreciate, you know, the people that put together all the work and this is a lot of work. Don't let anyone tell you different. It's a lot of work. So I appreciate, uh, you guys doing it. I got you. I got you. So that being said, uh, what did chicken say? Where did chicken say that right there? Chicken hit that, hit that like button. Y'all go ahead subscribe Do all the rest of these things. We're trying to get this channel to, uh, to a thousand and more. So go ahead, subscribe, share, do all the rest of those things. And um, with that being said, I think we are out of here.